Our topic for this session is comprehensive sexuality education and it's defined by UNESCO as an age appropriate, culturally relevant approach to teaching about sexuality and relationships by providing accurate, realistic and non-judgmental information. Around the world there are many different terminologies for and approaches to comprehensive sexuality education. However, the objective is clear. It's to ensure that young people are receiving comprehensive life skill based sexuality education to gain knowledge and skills to make conscious, healthy and respectful choices about relationships and sexuality. Our panel of speakers will share with you key areas of action and lessons learned which illustrate some examples of country specific programs that showcase the core elements of comprehensive sexuality education being gender, power relations and human rights. The evidence shows that by integrating content of gender and rights coupled with including the participation of young people makes sexuality education even more effective. So I'll briefly, um, the structure for this afternoon or this morning is each of our speakers will present and then we will open it up for questions. We were going to try and save about uh, five minutes at the end. All that stands between us uh, is in lunch. So we'll try and sort of be, uh, be tight um, to make up that time. So our, our first speaker is Anna Amelia Nimatu. And she's the program coordinator for, for the Association for Health Promotion Research and Education, or PS, in Guatemala. Rene Guerra is going to be uh, translating for her, and he is the program manager for Horizons of Friendship. And his specific focus is working on their Global Affairs Canada funded maternal newborn child health program in Guatemala. Next, we have Stephanie Lee Tholand. Stephanie is the director of program and partnership development from the Population Media Center. And lastly, Dr. Chandra Moli from the Department of Reproductive Health and Research um, from the World Health Organization. So, Emilia, speak to us. Sakari y Conogel, Emilia Nimatú de Guatemala. Es un placer para mí estar aquí participando el día de hoy en la conferencia global. Eh, quisiera recalcar algo. Estamos el día de hoy reunidos en el territorio no cedido de la nación algonquina. Good morning and welcome to all. My name is Emilia Nimatú from Guatemala. It's a pleasure to be here with you today at this global conference. And I'd like to start by recognizing that we're gathered here today on unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples. Propio a explicar nuestra intervención específicamente sobre la educación integral de sexualidad, quisiera hacerles una fotografía muy breve de cuál es el contexto de Guatemala. Before I share with you our program on comprehensive sexuality education, I'd like to speak to the context in which it plays out. Guatemala es una, es una nación multietnica, multilingüe y multicultural. Alrededor de 16 millones de habitantes aproximadamente. De esta población, Un poco más del 50% es población indígena. Guatemala es una multicultural, multietnica y multilingüe nación con una estimada población de alrededor de 16 millones, de los que son de descendencia indígena. De esta población, del total de la población guatemalteca, alrededor de la mitad de, vive en pobreza. More than half of the population lives in poverty. Y cuando hablamos propiamente de la población indígena, este se incrementa un 75%. And we, when we speak specifically to indigenous people, this rises to 75%. En el tema de salud, más del 90% de la población no tiene acceso. When it comes to health services, more than 90% of the population doesn't have access. Nuestra fecundidad es alta y se incrementa en la población indígena. The fertility rate is high and even higher for the indigenous population. Tenemos una de las razones de muerte materna más altas de Latinoamérica, 103 por 100 mil nacidos vivos. We have one of the highest maternal mortality rates in Latin America, 113 per 100,000 live births. Los guatemaltecos en promedio logran terminar la educación primaria, pero si se es indígena no existe ese acceso. Llegamos a cuarto grado primaria. So the average Guatemalan finishes primary school, but if she or he is indigenous, that average is only up to the fourth grade. 
Como vemos, a Guatemala la golpea la desigualdad y la exclusión. As we can see, Guatemala is afflicted by inequality and exclusion. Y es en este marco en donde los derechos sexuales y derechos reproductivos existen en este contexto, pero se enfrentan a grandes desafíos, a patrones culturales y religiosos. So, sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, in the country exist in this difficult context and they further face the challenge of social, religious, and ideological norms. Y por otro lado también, eh, esos arraigados roles de género que controlan la sexualidad en general de la población, pero se intensifican en la población femenina. And also the deeply entrenched views on gender roles that weaken sexual and reproductive rights and that ultimately uh, culminate in control over uh, female sexuality. Guatemala ha ratificado eh, marcos legales, tratados internacionales sobre los derechos sexuales y reproductivos. Y a nivel nacional contamos con una legislación muy, muy fuerte, y específicamente para la implementación de la educación integral de sexualidad en las escuelas públicas y a todo nivel. So, Guatemala has uh, ratified treaties and international agreements supporting sexual and reproductive health and rights, and it has a relatively robust national legislation that calls for the implementation of CSE in schools. Específicamente, es una carta acuerdo entre el Ministerio de Educación, Prevenir con Educación. So specifically, it's an agreement uh, with the Ministry of Education that's called Preventing with Education. Pero lamentablemente, todo esta, este marco legal no se traduce en programas o políticas que funcionen. But lamentably, this legal framework hasn't translated into effective action or programs at work. Teniendo este panorama, eh, la Asociación para la Promoción Pies de Occidente en el año 2009 empieza su intervención implementando la EIS dentro del aula en las escuelas públicas de nivel primaria, secundaria y con poblaciones indígenas. So given the context, uh, our organization Pies de Occidente uh, has implemented since 2009 this comprehensive sexual education initiative in public primary and secondary schools. También tomando en cuenta que todas estas acciones las realizamos en coordinación con el Ministerio de Educación. All of these actions are in coordination with the Guatemala Ministry of Education. ¿Qué es lo que hacemos? En primer lugar, el trabajo está guiado por tres estrategias. So what do we do? First of all, our work is guided by three strategies. Primero, fortalecemos los programas, las políticas, eh, los planes de gobierno. So first, we strengthen the government's policies, plans, and uh, policies. Segundo, hacemos una coordinación interinstitucional con las organizaciones y redes que trabajan en pro de los derechos sexuales y derechos reproductivos. Second, we coordinate with uh, interdisciplinary, inter interinstitutional networks that also work on the topic. Y tercero, eh, realizamos o ejecutamos procesos de formación y sensibilización sobre la AIDS a tres niveles. Profesores, madres, padres de familia, niñez y adolescencia. And lastly, we carry out training and awareness raising at three different levels with teachers, children, adolescents, and parents. Para comenzar, quisiera explicarles un poco el trabajo que estamos haciendo con los maestros. Es un diplomado eh, donde abordamos las temáticas de la EIS. Este diplomado cuenta con los créditos académicos de la renombrada Universidad San Carlos de Guatemala. To start, I'd like to speak to the work that we do with uh, teachers. We developed a course on co comprehensive sexuality education accredited by the renowned uh, National University of San Carlos in Guatemala with the participation of primary and secondary school teachers and principals. Y también, como un proceso de acompañamiento, eh, hacemos un monitoreo realizado a los maestros que cumplan o que se gradúen de este diplomado y pues donde le, les incluimos o les dotamos de materiales didácticos de apoyo para la implementación de la EIS dentro del aula. So the program includes accompaniment of teachers who finish the course uh, in the implementation of CSC in, in public schools and that includes giving them didactic materials and a teaching guide. Y ahora el trabajo con, los, con la niñez y adolescencia eh, este trabajo conlleva la implementación de la EIS con estudiantes de primaria y secundaria de ambos sexos y en idioma eh, quiche. So the work with children and youth involves the implementation of CSE in the classroom made by both boys and girls in the quiche language. ¿Cómo lo hacemos? Dos palabras, actividades lúdicas. 
So how do we do this? In one word, edutainment. Y aquí pues incluimos el teatro, la danza, la pintura, eh, concursos artísticos que requiere la, la, la participación activa y reflexiva de cada uno de los, de los niños y los adolescentes. And that includes interactive activities, games, songs, dances, requiring the active participation of students. Este trabajo también se complementa por una campaña de comunicación social en la cual pues eh, nosotros realizamos spots radiales con mensajes de sensibilización sobre la AIDS. So the work is complemented by a mass communications campaign that reaches uh, the population at large through radio spots in Quiche and Spanish. Sí, está, son, está, estos spots están mediados en idioma español y Quiche. Y por otro lado también estamos trabajando eh, como para complementar el trabajo dentro de la escuela, integrar a padres y madres de familia. We're also working with parents at schools. Con el objetivo de fortalecer a la familia, que es la fuente primaria sobre la educación integral y sexualidad, que lamentablemente esto no se traduce a una realidad dentro de las familias. With the aim of strengthening the role of that families play as sources of information on the topic, something that rarely occurs at the moment. ¿Qué avances hemos tenido? ¿Qué hemos logrado nosotros desde 2009 para acá? En primer lugar, hemos beneficiado alrededor de 550 eh, profesores, 20 mil eh, adolescentes, niñez y adolescentes, y también alrededor de, de 2,300 madres y padres de familia. Todo esto ligado a 180 escuelas. So, some of the key results and success we've achieved are, are there, beneficiaries, approximately... Uh, 20,000 girls and boys, 500 teachers, more than 2,300 parents. <clears throat> y algunos resultados que hemos obtenido implementando la AIDS dentro del aula y esta iniciativa es que hemos sido como una organización que ha abierto los espacios, ha abierto esas brechas para que realmente la AIDS sea una realidad en cada aula. Uh, so some of the successes we've had, we've developed strategic alliances with uh, state entities uh, that are guarantors of rights for, and for uh, comprehensive sexual education in the classroom. Otro también, otro logro o resultado ha sido que hemos consolidado una alianza estratégica con el Ministerio de Salud y Ministerio de Educación, que son los, que, los ministerios relacionados a la AIDS. So again, uh, the, this, uh, this alliance with uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, which is a, a, um, the state agent that uh, is most relevant when talking about comprehensive sexual education. Y también la integración de la Universidad de San Carlos de Guatemala para proporcionar los créditos académicos de este proceso formal, en donde el maestro adquiere habilidades, competencias para que pueda implementar la AIS. And also uh, attaining the academic credits through the University of San Carlos uh, to formalize the, the, the training with teachers. Y tal es uno de los resultados más importantes que hemos logrado nosotros como organización es hacer valer el derecho de la niñez y adolescencia a la educación integral en sexualidad. No solamente para que tengan información, sino que para poder fortalecer la decisión, su empoderamiento para la toma de decisiones autónomas de su cuerpo. And uh, overall, uh, the major contribution has been to uh, train uh, comp in comprehensive sexual education as a fundamental right for children, adolescents, so that they have more autonomy over their, their sexuality and their bodies. <clears throat> Como retos y lecciones aprendidas, eh, el tema de la educación integral y sexualidad dentro de nuestros contextos es un tema tabú. Es un tema que no se habla. Entonces tenemos que enfrentarnos a esas vivencias familiares que no permiten que se hable la sexualidad. So one of the challenges that we face and continue to face is that uh, the topic is taboo. So facing family and social norms concerning sexuality uh, is a difficult topic uh, to discuss. También otro reto es realmente fortalecer la incidencia ante los ministerios, ante los garantes eh, de derechos para que ellos asuman su compromiso y realmente se convierta en una realidad la EIS dentro del aula, no solamente con la formación de los maestros, sino también la asignación de recursos financieros. Again, uh, strengthening community advocacy for state authorities so that uh, uh, they increase political and budgetary support for comprehensive sexual education. 
Y por otro lado también uno de los retos es poder realmente incluir a los líderes comunitarios que dentro de estos contextos ellos son los que toman las decisiones muchas veces de la participación de las niñas y de las mujeres. Uh, another uh, challenge or lesson learned is to involve local traditional authorities for sustainability in this from the outset. Yeah. Okay, yo voy a terminar. Y para resumir todo esto, pues eh, esto es una puesta en práctica de lo que al gobierno de Guatemala le compete. So, uh, in summary, all of this constitutes putting into practice that for which the Guatemalan state is ultimately responsible. Maltios Chalachahue. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andrea. Very good. Gracias. Gracias. Stephanie? We'll just hold our questions until the end. Hi. We share a vision of all adolescents everywhere being able to access information and get what they need to stay safe and healthy and in charge of their own bodies and life direction. This is what we wish for our youth. As Amelia alluded to, unfortunately, that comprehensive sexual education that the youth need is very often a mythical concept. Cultural norms, social taboos, religious doctrines, remote geographies, and insufficient funding, every country has its own set of unique factors that restrict access to education and services for youth. A lot of youth get missed because nowhere does it perfectly, often leading to disastrous results. But youth everywhere always find a way to access media, radio, TV, social media, web, you name it. So it's, we have to find a way for CSE to be integrated into the media where the youth already are in a useful and accessible way. Because media has the power to take down some of those barriers. So how can we effectively include CSE in the media in a way that helps youth to overcome those cultural, religious, and social barriers? As part of addressing the enabling environment, those barriers have to be treated and affected at the same time as we are informing the youth in different but complementary dialogue. In order for those deeply entrenched barriers to bend, the approach has to tackle existing norms in a personal and emotional way that connects adolescent sexual health to other issues of importance to adults. PMCs, population media centers, drama programs can do all of this, and we have the results to show how effective it can be. The entertainment can't only be about youth, and it can't only be about sex. It has to reflect the everyday challenges facing an entire community, and illustrate a realistic path for how those challenges can be overcome. PMC melds entertainment industry insight with scientific behavior theory to create powerful TV and radio dramas that can motivate people to want to make different choices, to seek new knowledge, and to believe that they have the power to change their own lives. Stories, especially long-running ones, are the perfect vehicle for addressing these deeply held personal beliefs. PMC-style dramas can integrate sensitive topics like teenage sex and avoid backlash because it's woven into a complex story about seemingly real people and real situations. Our dramas don't include direct messaging, and they don't lecture, which is key to having an impact on youth, but it's also key to having an impact on anyone's behavior. They have to feel motivated, not pressured, to make that change and that choice. Our dramas create a safe space for these types of ideas to be explored without personal risk. PMC's drama design fosters achievable and gradual change on both individual and societal levels through the use of mass media. Currently in Nepal, we have two radio programs on the air addressing child marriage and youth-driven elopements. The programs are targeting the youth, but necessarily including key adult influencers, especially parents. 
In fact, the parents of our, the, writer, the head writer of our current child marriage storyline in Nepal were receiving marriage offers for her before she was age 15. She counts herself very lucky and credits her mother with choosing to allow her to pursue her studies, her career, and her choice of husband. She's now using that career to help millions of other girls in Nepal. We're also, and Amelia will be pleased to know, coming to Guatemala this year with a Spanish drama program to address a lot of reproductive health issues there. <laughs> we'll be in touch. Northern Nigeria, one of the most conservative parts of the world. Addressing sexual health and education there is no easy task. PMC has been working across Nigeria's northern states for 10 years now. And with our fourth radio drama now, so far, we've never once been pulled off the air or received backlash from the public or religious leaders. Quite the opposite. Our drama, Ruandare, attracted 12.3 million loyal listeners and activated over a million new users of family planning. The cost to achieve all of those new adopters was just 89 cents US each. With an audience this large and diverse, Listening and talking about family planning and women's rights in northern Nigeria, remarkably, there was no uproar, just positive social and health changes and discussions on a large scale, all in the course of two years. Now, there's a lot of work more to be done, but we can create new social norms. And we all know in North America, Sex ed isn't all that much better than in developing countries. In the US, PMC created a show called East Los High to help address sexual education amongst the Latinx population, especially teenage pregnancy issues, which are especially high. The, a website was created to accompany the show's online resources full of fresh content to also connect the viewers with online resources and information. The show was created by a completely Latinx team, and it shows and how it speaks directly to the issues and context of East LA. It shot immediately to the top of Hulu.com's rankings and has stayed there for four seasons, along the way earning itself five daytime Emmy nominations. Ultimately, 60% of the viewers said that they shared those online resources with a friend. Now in the US, the approach to tackling sex ed in the media can be a lot more tantalizing and in your face because that's what the audience is used to and it fits with the culture, which is important in any project we do in the media. So East, Ella, East Los High is using this to educate and motivate youth to know how to stay safe, healthy, and responsible with sex. But it's also super entertaining, even for adults. Here's a quick clip to show you a bit of what it's like. Positive role modeling within good entertainment can not only provide motivation around specific behaviors and use of services, but it can also show how others, how to communicate with others and provide examples of what it's like to face tough conversations and make hard decisions. For so many teens and youth, good role models and comprehensive sex ed are hard to come by. Through programs like these, we're able to deliver some of both. Pro-social media, using PMC's methodology, can deepen the circle of positive influence in millions of lives and help deliver comprehensive sex ed by reaching audiences and youth where they already are, which is consuming entertainment. Thank you.
Thank you, Stephanie. Chandra? So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in my uh, presentation, I'm going to talk to you about how three countries in three very different uh, geographic areas and very different socio-cultural contexts built community support and dealt uh, with resistance to sexuality education. I'll begin with a word of context. In 2014, UNFPA led the uh, publication of this report, a report of implementation of the International Conference on Population and Development's Plan of Action. Ban Ki-moon, the then Secretary General, signed this report. And in this, what he says is that children and adolescents need sexuality education. There's evidence that sexuality education does not harm and helps. Methods and tools are available. Projects have been implemented, but large-scale implementation, as Stephanie said, has been found wanting. That was 2014. Things have changed a little. There's much more action. And what we've been doing over the last three or four years is identifying countries which have moved from small-scale, time-limited, boutique projects to large-scale programs. And one example is Jharkhand state in India. While many states in the country stopped sexuality education because of political backlash, this state government decided to continue. And it has extended its program throughout the state, continued it for five years, and now taken it to uh, the lower classes, six, seven, eight. So our questions are not only how did they do it, but you know, what, what, what drove the process? You know, how, what were the lessons we can learn from that? One of the lessons we have learned is that it's very important to work to build support and overcome resistance. And I've got three examples. The first is Pakistan. Pakistan, you have a national policy on sexuality education, but there's very little government-led implementation. So there's a loose network of NGOs Rutgers Pakistan and Ahang are two examples, which worked to build community support. They chose topics in consultation with the community that the communities agreed to support, such as child marriage or um, acid throwing on girls or sexual harassment on the street. These were activities that the community supported. They chose language that the community supported. They didn't call it sexuality education. They called it life skills-based education. They worked with religious leaders to vet content, but made sure that it was not watered down to the point of uselessness. And lastly, they reached out to various stakeholders to build support and understanding of what they were doing. Backlash came from time to time. An alliance of Muslim religious um, uh, parties, um, political uh, parties and media, a small group of people, and their attack was essentially bullying. They attacked these NGOs and say, you're corrupting young people in Pakistan, we'll file a court case against you. And so their approach was, they never approached these bullies. They sent uh, supporters in the media to work with them as intermediaries. And once the dust settled, they called media to come and visit the schools and see what was done. And they actively engaged. Now. In Pakistan, your sexuality education has been extended through Balochistan and Sindh. And the, the network of NGOs continues to expand. Another example is Nigeria. In Nigeria, a group of non-government organizations led by Action Health Incorporated demonstrated the need, the feasibility, and the utility of putting in place sexuality education. They demonstrated its value. They also demonstrated to political leaders that nobody would come and burn buses or start a riot uh, when they did that. They developed, formed a coalition to advocate for national policy and strategy. This was a nine-year journey. And they formed a national policy and a national scale-up plan. And then with funding from MacArthur Foundation, Ford Foundation, Packard Foundation, 
NGOs worked with state governments to scale it up. And in Kanu State, for instance, in the north, a Muslim uh, state, um, an association for reproductive and family health worked with the state government as partners to implement sexuality education. They also worked with madrasas to develop an Islamia version, which was applied in 4,000 madrasas. Both in Nigeria and in Pakistan, there are e-approaches, there are mobile health approaches, and in Nigeria, as Stephanie said, there is media. But these approaches have also sought to work with parents and work with teachers. I have examples and documents from Nigeria and Pakistan, but I'd now like to go to Texas. Sexuality education is not mandatory in the US like it is in Germany, for instance. State governments do not fund sexuality education. And there are no obligations on schools to provide sexuality education. And in states like Texas, there was a very progressive law that everyone who graduates secondary school needs to have a health education class. Some wise politicians struck that off the list. And the result is here for everyone to see. 25% of kids get no education. 58% of kids get abstinence-only education. This is 2015, at the end of the Obama years. It's improved but very, very slightly, perhaps even less slightly than Pakistan. So what is this group of NGOs doing, the Texas campaign to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, for teenage pregnancy? They work with school boards. They work with school health advisory um, uh, councils. And they work with these councils to, to, uh, to deal with resistance. Because every so often, you have a group of parents who comes with some supporters from outside to block the school health advisory council. So they have intelligence. They act with these people, and they stop, the sexual, stop these in their tracks. And again, uh, this, this document by Professor David Wiley uh, describes how the situation has evolved. Happy to share this as well. To conclude, last week I was in Cairo. And I was very interested to find out whether things had changed since this Population Reference Bureau report in 2012. A good sexuality education program was developed. It was being implemented, what's and all, not perfect. Arab Spring, new government, stopped everything. Problem in Egypt is, unlike Pakistan, unlike Texas, unlike Nigeria, they are where they were in 2011. No progress. The point is, when we deal with abortion, when we deal with anal sex, when we deal with, you know, uh, premarital sexual activity, we are going to face resistance. And it's going to get worse. And what we need to do is we need to bend as much as we can. And we need to find a way to move as the Pakistanis have done. On the one hand, they have the mullahs. And on the other hand, they have these very aggressive Dutch sexuality education advocates. And they have found a way to work in between them. Thank you very much. I have summaries of my documents here. Please have a look at this, because I think what this points to is that uh, wherever we are, whether we are in Texas or in England or in India, we are fighting the same peop uh, battles. We are the same people. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra. Wow. Some amazing examples of lessons learned and backlash from many different countries. We have about uh, seven minutes or so left for questions. I didn't know if people had questions, if you could come up to the mic and you could either address them to the panel generally or, um, or to a specific uh, panelist. Kathy, can I just say we have sure. colleagues from UNFPA and UNESCO with oh. whom we have done much of this work. Just want to acknowledge their presence in the room and my boss, Ian Askew. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Of course. I have a question. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, primero que todo, felicidades, Ana Emilia. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you to Ana Emilia and the other panelists. I'm Mirta Olivares from Pro Familias Puerto Rico, and also a member of IPPF, International Planet Parenthood uh, Western Hemisphere Region. And it was. Uh, Discussing what uh, Bikantrama, 
I, I say well? Chandra. <laughs> Uh, some of the resistance that the comprehensive sexuality education have as talking about implicit uh, themes. Uh, so in order of that, which are the subjects that encounter more resistance in the comprehensive sexuality education and discussion and also in the implementation that you have been seeing your experience? Thank you. Did you want to comment? Sure. Yeah, I can. You know, um, I think all over the world, the, the big fear that many adults have is that sexuality education puts ideas in the minds of children before they're ready to start thinking about sex and that it puts condoms on the penises of five-year-olds. <laughs> so it pushes them to have sex when they're not ready. And this is a big fear everywhere. So even the idea of sexuality education is a no-go in many places. But I think the, a lot of resistance that we've seen in the last five years is associated with the use of comprehensive sexuality education. That's why when UNESCO is updating the technical guidance, they've decided not to use the word comprehensive in the title because comprehensive is now understood to mean LGBTQ. It means, um, it means things that people are still not ready to accept in many places. Yes. And this is, a res this is what you see in countries like Mexico. The Mexican government brought these areas together. Sexuality education, there was a little bit of resistance, but not much. But when they tied it with um, LGBTI issues, there was a whole level of different resistance. Yes. So that's a half answer. No, very good, very good point. Age appropriate and comprehensive means different things in many different countries, yes. Uh, my name is Janani with Plan International Canada. Um, so you've spoken quite a bit about resistance that um, comprehensive sexuality education faces. And I'm wondering if you can speak about any experience you might have with delivering maybe CSC for parents who can actually speak about these issues in their home because it's, it's quite difficult to do. Or even um, I've heard of uh, situations in Bangladesh where the curriculum would include comprehensive sexuality education, but there would never be any relevant training for the teachers to, be actually, to actually be able to deliver that. So many of those topics would just be sent home, do your homework at home, don't, don't talk about it. So mm -hmm. if you have any uh, thoughts or ideas about how to deliver it, um, actually you know, providing a sexuality education for parents and teachers. Sure. Maybe we'll start with Amelia. Question around specifics for parents or teachers. You can sit. Eh, sí, nosotros hacemos este trabajo también con padres y madres de familia. So we carry out this work with the parents. Y realmente eh, nosotros lo enfocamos a valorar eh, las prácticas ancestrales. Desde la cosmovisión maya. So we, 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 the angle that we take is uh, valuing uh, ancestral practices. This is in indigenous communities, ancestral practices from a Maya cosmovision perspective. Tomando en cuenta eh, los valores de la, de la complementariedad, la dualidad y el respeto y el valor de las energías de lo, del hombre y de la mujer. So uh, taking into account uh, the ideas of complementarity, duality, and the respect and value for the energies, uh, male and female energies. Porque esto, esto permite que a la hora de que nosotros implementemos la EIS, pero también integrando los valores de la, desde la cosmovisión maya, permite esa, esa, esa conexión y hacer esa relación de respeto de los derechos de la niñez y de la adolescencia en el tema de la sexualidad. So it, it allows us to build a connection. So to use the, the ancestral, ancestral traditions as a tool to build those connections to promote comprehensive sexual education within that context. Perfect, thank you. Stephanie, did you want to add any comments? Or? We always look to partner with organizations providing such so that we can connect people to them. Perfect, Chandra? Yeah. So uh, two points, firstly for me, uh, my son is 29, but when my son was six or seven, I needed to talk to him. And I bought a wonderful book, which I still recommend, and I buy on Amazon in bulk and then give it to friends. It's called <laughs> Questions Children Ask How to Respond to Them by Miriam Stoppard. 
It's a wonderful book which, where you can, uh, uh, where you can uh, talk to a child about homosexuality at the age of two, four, six, eight, age appropriate, with words that you don't need to think about, but words which are there. So that's one tool which I strongly recommend. What we have done in WHO is work with the World Council of Churches to develop parent education materials. Uh, WHO recommends five things that parents need to do. Connection, regulation, provision, role modeling, and building autonomy. And this we have developed into tools that the World Council of Churches has developed for small Christian communities to use. Very happy to share a link of that with anyone who's interested. Perfect. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. We could probably share that on the app. So I'm, I'm getting the one minute uh, warning. Remember I said it's us and lunch. So um, did you want to? I just, I just have a, sorry, it's uh, Tarek Banji from Oxfam Canada. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question about um, gender-based violence within comprehensive sexuality education. I think a lot of the emphasis goes around the productive health and sex, but I think in a lot of contexts, especially maybe Guatemala and even in the U.S. and, and on some of the, um, a lot of countries, uh, GBV is a really important aspect. And I was wondering how, um, how you would integrate that within some of your work. Hmm. Would you like to start? Sure. Go ahead, please. Definitely. Well, I'll speak and say that a lot of gender-based violence, I think the vast majority occurs within relationships. So role modeling how to be respectful and how to communicate within relationships is essential so that there are these examples in young people's lives, even if they're not in their own homes or in their communities, but that they're seeing some example of how to be respectful and how to diffuse situations and resolve conflicts that don't re require violence to do so. So uh, thank you for the question, a very important one. You know, UNICEF has published a report a report card on adolescents which says that by the age of 15, boys in many countries, boys who are not married, um, think it's perfectly okay to beat your wife, a wife you've not met or married yet, if she burns the food, if she's disrespectful, if she leaves the house without your permission, if she refuses sex. So gender socialization begins very early. And the UNESCO guidelines which are being updated are going to incorporate activities to challenge and stimulate discussion on gender socialization in young adolescents. So you don't wait till the violence happens. You start building equitable gender norms at 10, 12. We are involved in a big global study on that. I'm happy to talk to that uh, with anyone who's interested. Excellent. Amelia, did you want to comment on gender-based violence? Yes, for us it's a topic that que ha generado también preocupación porque eh, también dentro de nuestros contextos comunitarios el tema de la violencia de género es muy fuerte so y for, entonces ah, so for us it's a, it's a it's a worrisome issue and in at the community level gender based violence is a, a reality y entonces enfrentar a esos patrones eh, realmente es eh, es algo muy importante porque el tema de la perspectiva de género lo incluimos dentro de la EIS como un eje transversal so because of its importance, we include uh, gender-based violence as a uh, transverse uh, topic or theme in, in all of our comprehensive sexual, sexuality education programming. Y no solamente lo hacemos como en los grupos con los niños y a los adolescentes, sino también lo, lo abordamos con, dentro de la familia, los padres, madres de familia y los profesores. So not only that work happens not only with uh, the children or the students, but also with teachers and parents. Excellent. Thank you. The panelists will be around if you, if you have questions over the lunch hour. And um, thank you. Thank you for being a great audience.